My name is Matt Provost. Uh, I'm the engineering manager on the SRE team uh, for Yelp in London. Uh, although, as you can tell from my accent, I'm actually uh, from New England, not Old England. Uh, you may remember me. I've spoken at Lisa before in a previous life when I used to make movies in New Zealand. So I kind of move around. Uh, so I'm sure most people are familiar with, uh, with Yelp. Uh, Yelp connects people with uh, great local businesses. Uh, and the SRE team makes sure that the site is up and running so that we can, we can always do that. Uh, I'm going to talk to you today about uh, something that, that I sort of learned about uh, over the past year or so, which, which is uh, interesting. And it's something from uh, the UK's NHS called Never Events. Um, and it's really about building uh, safe systems. Uh, I think there's a lot we can learn from, from people in, in the healthcare world about how to, how to do this, where they're actually dealing with life and death uh, situations. So first, I'll just give you a little capsule history of the NHS. Uh, it was established in June 1948 by Clement Attlee's post-war labor government. It's the world's first universal healthcare system. I had three founding core principles, to meet the needs of everyone, to be free at the point of delivery, and to be based on clinical need, not the ability to pay. Uh, I do have to say, just briefly, for someone living in, in England as, and as someone that grew up in America, it's very strange to go to the doctor and see a doctor and then just walk out um, without having to show ID or, or pay in any way. Uh, it serves 64.6 .6 million people in the UK. It sees a million patients every 36 hours. Uh, and it's the fifth largest employer in the world with 1.7 million staff. Uh, I had to look up what the other, what the top five are. Uh, number one is the US Department of Defense. Uh, then McDonald's, uh, Walmart, uh, and the Chinese People's Liberation Army. <laughs> and then number five is, is the NHS. So it's, it's an enormous uh, system. And one of the benefits to that is that because it's integrated as a single universal healthcare system, they can provide a lot of documentation and statistics that are publicly available, and which is what I really base this base this talk on. Uh, Ipsos, who's a polling organization, did a post-Brexit uh, poll last summer to sort of get the various moods of the, of the country. Um, and they asked the public what they were uh, most proud of to be British. Uh, and, and the NHS came out uh, as number one. Um, you can see well ahead of uh, third place was the royal family. Uh, British sports teams was almost way down the way down the bottom. Um, so people are 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 quite proud of that. Um, I don't know if if any of you remember during the London 2012 Olympics, Danny Boyle's sort of opening ceremony had a whole section about it with people singing and dancing about the NHS that apparently was confusing to American audiences. But today we're going to talk about uh, a system that they came up with called uh, Never Events. And Never Events are specific types of incidents that should never happen in the NHS because preventative safety measures have been put in place. So it's important not only to protect the patients, but also to protect staff. Uh, in healthcare, there's a term, the second victim, which refers to the staff involved in a serious incident. So staff may require things like counseling to recover from a mistake that may have caused a patient's death. Um, and as SREs or system administrators, we're responsible for keeping the site up. And we even borrow terms from the medical world, like postmortems when something goes wrong. Um, but in reality, nobody dies when the site goes down, right? Um, if Yelp goes down, you won't be able to find the best local business, and you might end up having a bad meal. Um, and a lot of people might end up having a bad meal. Um, but our industry struggles with industry our industry struggles with issues around stress and on call and burnout. So I think it's important that we look to other fields to see what we can learn about how they try and prevent their staff from being put in the position of becoming the second victim. So the NHS defines what a serious incident is. Uh, a never event is a specific type of serious 
incident. It's important to define what qualifies as an incident or an outage for any organization. Um, that's really the first step. In the NHS, it really breaks down into um, cases of unexpected or avoidable deaths, unexpected or avoidable injuries, uh, and actual or alleged abuse. And then this is the official definition. It goes into sort of all the cases, all the cases of that. Uh, Yelp has its own system uh, for sort of classifying uh, serious incidents. Uh, it's called a DAR, uh, D-A-R. It's not an acronym. Uh, it's named after Darwin the dog. So this was Jeremy Stoppelman, our CEO's uh, puppy. Uh, he had it in the office one day uh, in his crate. Um, and somebody said, hey, is the site down? And it turns out this is in the act of chewing through a Cat5 cable. Um, the site actually wasn't down. The person on the other end of that cable, their laptop was was down, but um, but that's it. So this was the original error page. It has a sort of cartoon version of Darwin the dog on it now, um, but originally it was just a picture of that. So in the operations incident response runbook, uh, one of the things we say is, uh, are we serving Darwin's or HA proxy error pages? And that's how we know that the that, that we're in an incident. Darwin's basically meeting uh, 500 pages. So there are really only four criteria that the NHS uses for deciding if something is a never event, if deciding if a serious incident is a never event. It has to be wholly preventable, uh, has the potential to cause serious patient harm or death, uh, it has occurred in the past, and there's a risk of recurrence and it's easily recognizable and clearly defined. So we'll just have a little bit closer look at, at some of these. So the first one, it says it's wholly preventable. Um, all never events are serious incidents, but they don't necessarily result in serious harm or death. But there are things that are under our control, right? So someone getting cancer uh, or having a heart attack or something, while well, unfortunate, right, is, is not under the direct control of the staff. It's not a preventable uh, kind of thing in, in, in a hospital setting. So for us, something that happens externally is not an ever event, like a DDoS attack um, or an AWS region failure. Um, so maybe region failure is a never event if you're working for AWS, um, but for the rest of us poor mortals, um, something like that is just happening outside of our control. Um, and so we can't really take all the steps necessary to prevent it. Um, so this talks about having uh, strong systemic protective barriers in place. Just to define those, they talk about having physical barriers, so special equipment that makes it impossible to connect medications via the wrong route, or time and place barriers. Um, which could be basically systems of double or triple checking, where supported by visual or computerized warnings, procedures, or memory communication aids. So those are the kind of barriers that they that they put in place to stop nerve events from happening. Um, once I started thinking about this, I started seeing it all over the place. I took this picture not too long ago on the in London. Uh, it's a van for the wrong fuel doctor. Um, it says petrol and diesel, diesel and petrol, so putting the wrong fuel fuel in a car. Um, and it got me thinking about that whole concept that they just mentioned about making you know incompatible connectors. So in, in uh, cars, there's no such thing, right? You can, the only difference is it sort of shows the two there that one of them is green and one of them is black, but you can pretty easily put a diesel thing and fill up your uh, gasoline car with diesel. Uh, they're color-coded, but actually it's interesting that the color coding is opposite between the U.S. and the U.K. Uh, and then it's non-standard, so different vendors. You could find a yellow nozzle for diesel, and maybe you have to sort of read the sign. Um, but if they'd made, you know, diesel have a square connector and gasoline have a round connector, then you would never have a case of putting, you know, diesel in a, uh, in a gasoline car. Um, so you start to see these things. Um, that's uh, you know that that wouldn't be a never event of putting uh, putting the wrong fuel in something because there's nothing preventing you from from doing that other than sort of reading the reading the label. Uh, so we've had we've had cases like this uh, in the past. 
Uh, on our external load balancers, we used to, uh, we had a series of outages caused by running out of uh, TCP ephemeral ports. Um, so we used to hit the, hit the limit, you know, there's 65,000 available. Um, we were connecting on local host uh, between Nginx, which was doing our SSL termination, and HAProxy, which was doing load balancing. Um, and this happened several times until finally we decided to just change the sort of connector entirely and we moved it to uh, Unix domain sockets, uh, which don't have a 65,000 limit. Um, and now we don't have that anymore. And now we can say something like, a never event for us is like never run out of ephemeral ports on a on a load balancer. Let's just change the system to sort of make that thing uh, less likely to happen. Uh, and I think it's important that they, they call out you know, the sort of human factor. As all human action is vulnerable to human error, particularly where there is a risk of staff becoming overloaded, that may sound familiar. Processes that rely solely on one staff member checking the actions of another or referring to written policies are not considered strong barriers. So never events aren't really just about saying like, don't do that again or have someone sort of double check. You have to go a little bit further than that. Uh, another criteria is that each never event have, has to have the potential to cause serious patient harm or death. Um, However, serious harm or death is not required to have happened uh, for an incident to be triggered um, under this system. So I think that's really, uh, really important to call out because I don't think most organizations uh, do that. But it is pretty common uh, across other industries. So as I was looking into this, I found there's an organization called DROPS, um, which is a global working group, mostly in the oil and gas industry, um, that's concerned about dropped object safety. So they have conferences just like this, um, sitting around talking about uh, how to prevent dropped object injuries. Uh, and these are their recommended practices, minimum guidelines. Um, and they point out that um, you have to report all dropped object incidents, whether or not the incidents result in injuries. So if you're up on an oil tower and you drop a screwdriver off of it, and it just lands on the ground and doesn't hit anybody, do you just say, oh well, and go down and pick up your screwdriver and get on with your day? Um, the only reason it didn't hit somebody is because nobody happened to be walking under you, at, or, you know, right at that moment. Um, so it's still a serious incident, and they require that you report all incidents, whether or not it sort of hit anybody. Uh, the great thing about uh, the sort of reporting requirements, uh, they talk about having a drops calculator. Basically, in this case, you're dealing with gravity, so it's really easy to sort of calculate. So they have a drops calculator, um, and they categorize incidents uh, by severity. So you just have the distance that something fell and how heavy it was. Uh, green means a sort of slight injury. Yellow means you need medical treatment. Uh, orange is a lost time injury where you'll have to take time off work. And uh, red is fatality. Um, the other interesting thing about this is this accounts for people wearing personal protective equipment, so it, someone should uh, be wearing a helmet. Um, so if you had an incident where you dropped something, you just say, how high did it fall from? How heavy was it? Even if it didn't hit somebody, we know that it would have, you know, that it would have caused this. The distances are actually pretty, uh, pretty interesting. So, uh, so like this water bottle is 500 mil, so that's. 500 grams, because metric is cool. Um, so 500 grams dropped 20 meters is a fatality um, in this case, which is pretty, pretty serious. Um, so at Yelp, we have things that we call DAR levels. Again, DAR is the term for our incident response. It means we're serving 500s. Um, so we have DAR1, the most serious, where the site's broken. And our official definition is, yeah, we're serving Darwin's. Uh, or just the site is hard down you know, at the network level, and we're not even able to serve 500s. Um, DAR2s, uh, users are having a bad experience, but the site is still pretty much up. Um, we may have lost some functionality, or we may just have you know, slow timings. Uh, and a DAR3 is more internal facing. So, uh, Users don't see that, but it affects our engineering organization. 
so it could be something like code cannot get into production, which means that we have a lot of engineers and developers sitting around not able to not able to do their jobs. Uh, the important thing is if the impact is unclear but it's still likely serious, we um, treat it as if it's a DAR1 and then do the classification uh, after the fact. So another criteria for a never event is that it, uh, it has to have occurred in the past. So this really come out of what we in tech have borrowed uh, the term the post-mortem process. Um, so you, they have a national reporting and learning system where all serious incidents are reported into, uh, and then you can do that. Uh, we actually use JIRA for this. So every DAR is created as a JIRA ticket uh, in, a, in a DAR project within JIRA. So we have a really good record going back of all the incidents, and we can go back in and analyze those. And a risk of recurrence has to remain. So if it's just a really unlikely set of circumstances that you haven't seen a pattern of, uh, then it's probably not, not worth doing that. The other important thing here is that you don't do this as a thought exercise of sit, sitting around thinking, what are all the possible things that could go wrong? Um, let's just come up with a huge list. Um, it's really only after you're doing postmortems and seeing these in the wild that you can then classify it. And the final criteria is that it has to be easily recognized and clearly defined. Um, so you don't have disputes around classification. Is this an ever been? Is it not? Well, there's kind of this, kind of that. Uh, and we'll see as we as we go through the list that they've they've broken it down into pretty simple categories. So again, just to recap, the four criteria are wholly preventable, has the potential to cause serious harm or death, has occurred in the past, could occur again, and easily recognized and clearly defined. So because this is all public information, they publish uh, a list every year of all the never events that have happened, uh, not down to the individual incidents, of course, for like patient confidentiality, but uh, into the categories. Um, and they categorize uh, their list of never events into surgical, medication, mental health, and general. It's actually a pretty short list, uh, so we'll just we'll go through it. Um, so on the surgical side, there's wrong site surgery, um, so doing surgery in the wrong place, wrong implant prosthesis, and retain foreign object post-procedure, where they leave something inside of you that shouldn't be there. On the medication front, it gets pretty specific. Uh, misselection of a strong potassium solution, uh, a few chemo medications, things like that, insulin overdoses. Uh, the interesting one is wrong route administration of medication. Um, so again, that's back to the uh, putting diesel into a gasoline engine. That's the sort of thing they're trying to prevent there. So that would be like putting an intravenous uh, medication into like a spinal uh, setting or something like that. Uh, unfortunately, there's one for mental health. Um, we won't spend too much time on that. Uh, in the general category, some of them seem a little bit silly, falls from poorly restricted windows, but in a hospital, this is the kind of thing that you have to worry about. Uh, another interesting one is transfusion of ABO incompatible blood. So that's when you give someone uh, a blood transfusion from the wrong blood type. Uh, that can be fatal. Uh, and and I want scalding of patients, but I guess it can happen. So let's look at the percentage breakdown uh, for for that 12-month period. I publish it, uh, so you can see by far the most common one is wrong site surgery with 42%, uh, and really about uh, the next uh, the next quarter is retained foreign object. That's, again, when they leave something inside of you, followed by wrong implant, wrong root medication, and then it gets really small after that. So between the, between the first two categories, we have really about two-thirds of the incidents. So that's what we're going to focus on, uh, on talking about. And here are the actual numbers. So they're pretty low, 424. Um, again, you're seeing a million patients every 36 hours. 
Um, there were 424 over over a year. Um, I think there are some, you know, these are things that you say should never happen. Um, it's unfortunate that they do sometimes happen, but uh, some of these are, are really well uh, kind of under control. So you think about the number of times that people would get a blood transfusion in the hospital. They had one case in that 12 month period uh, where someone got the wrong blood type. So that really is a, an example of a, of a mature system that they've known about for a long time and have put a really a lot of, uh, a lot of safety procedures in place to make sure that that doesn't happen. Uh, so again, by far the most common are wrong site surgery and uh, retained foreign object. Uh, I tried to do this mental calculation, but I, I couldn't quite do it because it has a time element. But you know, they did 4.7 million surgical admissions over this time and had 178 cases. So I tried to sort of figure out how many nines of reliability is that? But nines has like a whole element of uptime and everything else. But it's pretty high. Uh, so breaking down the wrong site surgery uh, into specific procedures, uh, wrong tooth uh, accounts for you know, the, the biggest chunk, wrong site block, that's an anesthetic thing, wrong spinal level is the wrong vertebrae, uh, that's a tricky one because you can't see it except on x-rays, um, and then down into wrong finger and thumb. I mean, as I was looking at this, it sort of roughly follows, it's almost a probabilistic kind of thing, right? So you have 32 teeth, you have 24 movable vertebrae, you have 10 fingers. By the time you get down to eye, like wrong eye injection, it's kind of a coin toss anyway, right? You only have two eyes. Um, so it kind of roughly follows that. Um, but I was thinking about this, right? Like back in the old days when I had, you know, big Solaris machines, I had like six servers to take care of. What were the chances that I was going to pick the wrong one? Pretty low. Now that, you know, we're running everything in, uh, you know, in larger clusters, where we have access to AWS, people start talking about things like, uh, you know, cattle versus pets, as opposed to, you know, having these servers that were named after the Greek gods. Um, you know, one of the reasons it's uh, harder to do things with uh, teeth is they don't really have names. It's, you know, they have numbers, and but they're kind of indistinguishable. They're hard to mark, uh, things like that. It's probably a lot easier. Um, to shut down the wrong server in, in an environment like AWS with a sort of randomly generated host name that has the IP address in it than it was to sort of do something that's really identifiable. But if you take a step back and look at this and, and how it applies to us, it's really you're doing the correct procedure but in the wrong context. So you went in to get something operated on, they did the operation, but they did it on your left leg instead of your right leg. Um, I think we do this kind of thing all the time. Um, you know, how many people have committed to the wrong Git branch? Or, you know, the classic like RM, RF, slash, or just removing the wrong file anywhere in the file system. Like, I thought I was removing these files, but I actually removed, you know, I was in the wrong directory when I ran that command. Um, I might never fess up to this, but I'm sure somebody's pulled the wrong disk out of a RAID array. Um, or unplugged. Uh, the wrong uh, cable out of a switch um, until you hear the screams and plug it back in. Um, and I think it's important to think about these things too in the context of, of kind of near misses, you know, the drop screwdriver kind of thing, um, and treating these always as serious. So sometimes turning off the wrong server might not, uh, might not have a production impact. But you were still doing, you know, oh, I thought I was SSH'd into that server, but I was actually SSH'd into this other one, but that was like kind of a test machine, and so the users never noticed. Um, but you still, you're doing an operation, and you completely lost context to where you were doing it. So the only reason it happened to be a test machine was kind of luck. It could have been, you know, your master database. So you should really still, again, kick into that whole thing of like, whoops, I kind of did the wrong thing. Like, let's still treat this as a serious incident, even though it didn't have any, any production impact. So this is what uh, a JIRA ticket for, for one of our DARs looks like. Um, that's sort of a, an example of this kind of thing. Um, SQL is interesting because, you know, you think about doing the right thing in the, in the wrong place, they even use the where keyword, which kind of implies location, although I guess it's more of a, a logical thing. 
Um, so there was a query that was running an update statement without a where clause, which just means it affects you know every row. Um, this also, I think, in my book, wins the award for like the best description of a, of a DAR, impeding the usefulness. That's probably a nice way of saying like the site is down. Um, is this a preventable kind of thing? Well, sure, it's all software, right? Um, like you could update your SQL parser to just reject update and delete statements without a where clause. Um, so you just don't have that happen. I mean, nobody does that, but um, but it's software, right? You could, if if this was the kind of thing that that happened more than a few times, you might just say like, let's filter that out and just call that a call it a mistake. But this happens all over the place. I'll pick a few public postmortems, not to pick on the specific companies, but I think everybody remembers the GitLab outage back from January. The big story there was that they had like five different backup systems that all failed, so they ended up losing customer data. But the actual like root, root cause of the whole thing, they were reacting to an incident and someone uh, deleted some data on what they thought was the secondary system, but it was actually the primary and then Ultimately, there were no backups. That was kind of the story, but the root mistake was uh, wrong site surgery, right? Uh, AWS, the S3 one that happened a few months ago uh, in February, I think that took down like half the internet. Um, everybody that's using S3. I always love, Amazon always puts this like statement of competence into their postmortems of like an authorized person doing an established playbook. They, they don't want anybody to look like a cowboy just like logged into a system and doing something. Um, but they ran a command that they thought was going to run on a certain number of systems. It actually ran on a much larger number of systems and took down S3. It was the right command. They just did it to the wrong servers. Uh, this is a, a classic. Um, I see we have some Terraform users in the, uh, in the audience. Um, so Terraform, if you don't know, is a declarative configuration management tool for infrastructure managed by APIs, uh, like the a AWS API. Um, it's declarative, so you basically say, I want my infrastructure to look like this. Uh, if you happen to pass it a configuration that, says, that has no servers in the configuration, it pretty happily just says, oh, you want no servers in US East 1. I'll turn off all the ones you have running. Um, it kind of got me thinking, actually, because the two examples were like SQL and, uh, and Terraform. I think something to think about is like, is there something in common with declarative languages uh, that makes it easier to make these kind of mistakes? You don't have to like write in an iterator or anything to, to sort of go through it. Uh, this resulted in us uh, internally, I think, along with a, a lot of other people calling it terror form because it's, uh, it's sort of easy to do this. But it ultimately, uh, it led to a new procedure. Um, so instead of doing sort of Terraform apply where you say just apply this configuration, uh, now we do like a make plan where you get Terraform to tell you what it would do. Um, you copy and paste that into review board. Um, and you go through an approval process where you get to ship it from someone else on the team that says, yeah, these changes look good, and then you can apply your changes. So the benefit of having infrastructure as code is that you can do code reviews on changes, even with tools like, like Terraform. So we don't have this, this kind of thing anymore. That's essentially a, a never event. So in the surgical setting, they have a checklist so this is the WHO, the World Health Organization, surgical safety checklist as used by the, the NHS. Um, before you start the surgery, to make sure you're doing the right place, has the patient confirmed his or her identity, site, procedure, and consent? Uh, yes. The other <laughs> interesting thing about these checklists, there's no no. Um, <laughs> you just, um, and is the surgical site marked? So the other thing is uh, it has to be read out loud. Uh, the next step, again, to be read out loud, um, the surgeon, the anesthetist, uh, I think they're called anesthesiologists in the US, 
uh, and the registered practitioner, so the um, nurse, all verbally confirm what is the patient's name, what procedure, site, and position are planned. So you have a three-way check by the three people involved. Uh, and then, kind of as a segue, uh, at the end of the operation, you confirm that the instruments, swabs, and sharps, sharps counts are complete. Which is the next most common category of, uh, of never event, which is a retained foreign object post procedure. Um, so in this context, uh, a swab is like a piece of gauze, like a sponge that you use to absorb blood. Um, they're always the most problematic because once they've absorbed a lot of blood, they're hard to see. Um, so the most common category is for vaginal swabs, surgical swabs, uh, and then it kind of falls out from there into things like guide wires. I was really happy to see surgical needle happen once. That one's the kind of thing that keeps you up at night. But again, 4.7 million surgeries, your chances are, are pretty low. Um, and so this problem is really about time separation. Uh, so you do something uh, as part of the procedure, and then later you have to remember to undo it. Uh, and again, that's a really common uh, common kind of thing that, that we run into. Um, checklists are really difficult to do over, over extended amounts of time. Um, so they have really good counting systems for this kind of thing, which is why it, it doesn't happen very often. Uh, but again, the further uh, the separation is in time, so if you think about the number of site outages that have been caused by just basic things like domain name renewals um, or SSL certificate expiring, you know, you sort of install an SSL certificate and then make a note to do that again next year, um, you know, or set up an alert or something like that. Uh, you can't really do a checklist. You can't really, you know, put something in place um, to do to undo that later or you know, how many times have you blocked an IP on a firewall, uh, you know, because there's, you know, someone attacking you or, you know, there's some sort of suspicious traffic? What's, what's the follow-up procedure to that? Do you ever go back through and unblock that IP? Um, most of the time it just gets sort of forgotten in the configuration until years later. Um, so what we like to do is create tickets during the incident to clean up temporary fixes. So we may do something like uh, scale up uh, one region so we have more infrastructure and we can shift traffic there where we solve the problem. And then you put everything back together and then a few days later you say, we still have a whole bunch of servers running over there. We forgot to you know, turn them off afterwards. So as we're scaling things up, we might put a ticket like in 24 hours, go back and go back and scale down that, scale down that region. Sometimes it only really comes up as part of the postmortem. So as you're writing the, the postmortem kind of thing, you said, and then we did this, and you say, oh, did we ever undo that? No, let me quickly, quickly sort of go do that. So I guess just think about how many times, you know, in your experience has a temporary fix caused a secondary outage later, and that's really the, the sort of problem that we're that we're facing with with here. It's just a human, you know, comprehension problem. So they have nice you know, policies and procedures for doing counts. So, you know, they start with a, you know, pile of, you know, 10 swabs. You put a certain number in, you take a certain number out, you triple check it with everyone in the room to make sure the numbers match at the end, and then you're reasonably confident that you've, that you've undone everything. Uh, the other thing that was interesting is looking at the the top two, like vaginal swabs and surgical swabs, um, there was a small difference in the number of events, um, but there's actually a much bigger difference uh, in, in the number of incidents. So uh, in the UK, 97% of uh, babies are born in the NHS. Uh, there were 648,000 deliveries uh, that year uh, with 31 never events. So pretty low, but again, there were uh, 4.7 million surgeries and 22 uh, never events. So the actual incidence, um, you know, per million procedures is about 10x um, for childbirth. 
Uh, and there's a lot of studies uh, going into this because it's a never event, you know, declared by the NHS. So there's a lot of literature about it. Um, they don't use the surgical checklist during childbirth because it's not surgery. Uh, and typically there's only one person present. So you don't have that triple check system of having the surgeon, the anesthetist, and the nurse all triple checking each other's work. If there's only one person in the room, um, it's much harder to do that. And I think that's reflected in the, in the statistics. So I was thinking about this and, and what's the case where people are, are sort of on their own doing things? Like it's great that we have that system for Terraform where you, know, you, you um, post the changes into review board and you get other people to sign off on it. Um, you know, this all sort of falls down when you're on call, right? When you're, it's 3 a.m. and the pager goes off uh, and you're up, nobody else is online uh, and you're sort of in that world of, of having to make changes on your own. Um, so that's, that's really where it can get uh, dangerous is when you're outside of your normal procedures uh, and you don't have that sort of protection. Uh, we run a secondary on-call system, so we have primary and secondary. Um, so pages sort of fall through, but you always have a secondary. So if you are going to do something dangerous, like you think you have to run a Terraform uh, change to resolve an incident, you can always page the secondary, wake them up, Say I've got a you know I've got a review. Can you double check this? Make sure that everything looks good, and then we'll go ahead and, and commit it together. Um, so again, looking at the at the sort of separation, this was one of our certificates um, that expired uh, and took down some of our internal tools like Review Board uh, and PyPy the package, uh, Python package uh, system that we run internally. So this wasn't a user facing, this was a DAR3, uh, but without review board, nobody can ship code. So it's, it's pretty, uh, pretty significant. Uh, I mean, the, the actual problem here was that we had renewed the certificate and installed it everywhere that was in our uh, Puppet manifest. It's really nice and easy to do that. Um, but we had also installed it on some AWS uh, elastic load balancers, which aren't puppet managed. And everybody had forgotten that we'd done that because it was a year later. Um, so who's going who's gonna to remember that? Um, so yeah, it broke a few things. Uh, we fixed that and added it, added it to the list. But again, it's, it's hard to do, do things over, over a long amount of time. So the next thing is, so you've had a serious incident, you've had an ever event. Uh, this is the NHS's serious incident management process. Um, it's nice to have it all sort of laid out, uh, the things you do after you have a serious incident. So first you inform the organizational leaders, inform the patient or family, um, report it on the National Reporting and Learning System. So again, in our case, it would be creating a JIRA ticket. Uh, once it's done, you do a root cause analysis. There are other ways of doing this. It doesn't matter if you want to do five whys, whatever, choose your s sort of safety program of, of choice. Again, in tech, we often call this the postmortem stage, although nobody's died. Um, the NHS doesn't call it the postmortem stage because somebody doesn't necessarily have to have died. Um, postmortem is a more specific term. Then you review your learning and implementation plan. So these are, here are the things that we found that we need to, to do to make this better. Um, and then they have, it's a public organization, so they have public board meetings, they share the appropriate learning. So if you have figured something out, all the other hospitals uh, in the UK can learn from your mistakes. Uh, and then you do an annual report, which is what I'm, what I'm sort of basing this on. The important thing is that this is all on, on a uh, timeline. And so there are really strict deadlines around this. Uh, I think this is really key. So it gives you two days to inform the patient, hopefully the patient faster than the organizational leaders. Um, three days to report it in their learning system. 
Uh, you get 60 days to do root cause analysis, uh, and then 20 days uh, after that to review the uh, plan that comes out of the root cause analysis. Um, and they have a really good section of the, you know, their their book that says learning lessons from incidents requires timely incident reporting, which in turn requires a fair, open, and just culture that rejects blame as a tool. In part, this is because a patient safety incident cannot simply be linked to the actions of the individual healthcare staff involved. All incidents are also linked to the system in which the individuals were working. Looking at what was wrong in the system helps organizations to learn lessons that can prevent the incident recurring. If you just blame the individual staff in your hospital, that doesn't help other hospitals learn because they'll just say, well, we, we have better staff than that. We, don't, we, we didn't hire those people, so we're not gonna have the same thing happen. That's not really the case. So you can't do a safety talk without talking about airplane crashes. Um, so I had to put one in. Um, this was actually uh, really interesting. It was at um, SFO Airport in July. Uh, I don't know if people that aren't local to San Francisco have heard about this one. It was on an Air Canada flight. I just flew Air Canada into SFO a few days ago. Um, so it was kind of kind of personal. Um, but this was a plane landing uh, in A320. Uh, runway 28L was closed for maintenance. So there's always something that's gone wrong, right? Like you, you make these mistakes when you're responding to an incident. Something's out of the is happened out of the ordinary. You know, a system's failed, something's, something's going wrong. Um, basically, the pilots were expecting to see two runways, and they were told to land on the right runway. Uh, they didn't know or remember that the left runway was down for maintenance, so they lined up on the taxiway instead of the uh, right runway. Um, it actually would have been the worst uh, aircraft disaster of all time. Um, typically, the worst thing that can happen in a plane crash is that you kill everyone on the plane. Um, there were four fully loaded planes on the taxiway, so it would have killed over a thousand people. Um, they came as low as 59 feet uh, off the ground. You can see on the bottom picture, they've highlighted the plane. You can see another plane on the ground. They missed it by 12 feet. Um, so I think this sort of ties together a few different things. So this is a great example of wrong site surgery, right? They're doing the right thing. They lined up, they had the flaps down, you know, the, every, everything on the plane was, was working perfectly. They were gonna make a beautiful landing, except they were doing it on the taxiway instead of the runway. They, had, they were doing the right thing and they had just completely lost the context of, of where they should be doing it. Uh, the other thing that was really interesting about this um, was that the FAA, which had an air controller uh, working in the tower at the time, took more than 24 hours to, to notify the NTSB, the National Transportation Safety Board. Um, so in that time, uh, the pilots just you know, went to the hotel and then took off the next morning. Uh, air Canada you, uh, flew the plane three more times, uh, and the cockpit voice recorders are on a loop. So they got recorded over multiple times. The pilots were never tested for drugs and alcohol. Um, so we lost a lot of uh, pr sort of primary, primary evidence, um, which is really down to the point I was talking about the sort of time boxed stuff of uh, really doing your incident response quite quickly afterwards. Um, you know, I think everyone going all the way back to like RRD files is familiar with the fact that like information decays pretty quickly in our systems. So if you wait like weeks to go back and look at something, the resolution on your graphs might, might not be that good. Logs might have rotated off. Um, we use a lot of spot fleet. So you may even want to go back and, uh, you know, look at your bash history on one of the hosts that was involved in the incident and Amazon's killed it off and your bash history is gone. Um, all kinds of things like that. So it's important to turn that around pretty quickly. The other thing is that the FAA hasn't explained why it took so long uh, to report it, but the, actual, the NTSB said, actually, there's no legal obligation to report this because there was no plane crash. Right? There was no incident as far as, as, far as the NTSB is concerned. They missed. They had 12 feet to spare, and they took off again, and whatever. So it kind of highlights that thing of once you've declared something to be a never event, go through the process, 
even if it's a near miss, even if you shut down the test database instead of the live database, you are still doing something really dangerous in the wrong context. Go through that process, see what you can learn. Um, protect the second victim. Uh, it's not just about don't do that again or be careful, but put strong barriers in place to prevent uh, future incidents. This is just my checklist of how to implement it. I'm going to rip someone off and say, if you want to take a picture, this is the slide to do it. So define uh, what a serious incident is. Come up with a time boxed management process. Do your root cause analysis, postmortems. Collect never events out of that. Put systemic protective barriers in place and investigate near misses. Uh, I just want to say thanks to everyone in the NHS, uh, especially the junior doctors. Uh, and we're hiring in London and San Francisco. Come find me. Thank you.